Israel is a light onto the nations uh, for many reasons, but in technology, it's uh, really transforming the global industry. And uh, you have served uh, and have really uh, developed relationships and companies uh, to the forefront uh, in, in this tech society. How did you get into it? Well, uh, I did grow up in New York, moved to Israel, and the truth is, I'd love to pretend there was some big story, but it really was just me sitting at my first job, uh, having a real passion for technology, and starting to write about it. Um, ten fingers, no money, mm -hmm. just really genuine passion about technology and um, consistency. So after I started writing, you know, startups would reach out, I read your article, can we meet? I'd sit with an Israeli entrepreneur, and I'd ask him to tell me his or her story. And they'd start telling me about their algorithms. And I said, no one cares about your algorithms. Tell me about the pain point that you're solving, not what you're building or how you're building it, but why you're building it. And they'd say, oh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then they would uh, tell me their story, and I'd try to help them sharpen their pitch a little bit. Then I'd ask them who their competitors are, and they'd say, we have no competitor. <laughs> I'd say, of course you have competitors, and let them know their market a little bit, and just right. kind of help, help out. And that kind of scaled up over the years to kind of accidentally kind of position myself as the guy. If you're mm -hmm. building a company, mm -hmm. I get this email 400 times a week. I'm launching a product. I'm told I need to meet you. And I say, who told you that? So that's kind of what, uh, what's happened over the years. One of the things that I, that I found out, as a follower of yours, uh, yes, exactly. Oh, Jesus. But it's, but it's uh, you know, it, there's an art of, uh, of giving. Uh, and you give your time uh, to help companies and entrepreneurs reach their goals. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know you're in the process of writing your book, which is very exciting, and reading your, your blurbs. And, and it speaks to me for, no, for a number of reasons that, you know, when you have an entrepreneur that has an idea, it's like you said, it's like, oh, it's going to work. It's going to work. It's, please, you don't, you don't know. It's right. going to work. Right. But it really, there's that understanding that there's a startup and then there's that scaling out, but there's so much that happens in between. Sure. Um, and having met with a number of Israeli entrepreneurs uh, over the years, we hear, I hear chutzpah. That's the one that usually comes up, uh, but I think it's something deeper. Uh, what what have you found uh, in being you know being an entrepreneur yourself? Uh, but what is the underlying like DNA of these Israelis who really want to build something exciting? So I think you know there's books and books written on this topic. Obviously, Startup Nations on this topic as well. Um, I think it's probably a lot of different factors. Definitely the chutzpah that you mentioned. Also, I think you know historically speaking, we're always always we always have been and we always maybe will be in survivor mode. Right, um, and so maybe the energy we once used to survive, today we have. Thank God, we have the state of Israel. We have Tzahal. We, we're not fighting for our, we, as a nation we are, but as individuals, we're not fighting for our survival every day. And so we're taking that energy and maybe perhaps kind of rerouting it to innovate. Um, that's number one. And number two, you know, I always say when you ask the average American, what's the most important thing for you in the world? Like, what do you want to say in your tombstone? Most people would say, I want to be a good person. In Israel, as you know, the most important thing for Israelis, for better or for worse, by the way, and, and I'm actually not kidding, is not to be a friar. Right? In Israel, it's like, why would I let you into my lane? Like, in America, you put your blinker on, I slow down, let you into my lane, right? In Israel, I see you putting your blinker on, so I speed up. Why would I, put, why would I let you into my lane, right? Why would I be a friar? And so that's not so good when it comes to doing business. Marketing, you got to, like, chill. But when it comes to innovating, when, when someone tells an Israeli that it's not possible, most people would say, okay, well, let me reconsider. In Israel, it's like, you tell me it's not possible, now I'm going to try even harder. One of the other things that I, I noticed sort of, you know, over, even over the last 10 years, um, we're seeing different types of sectors really growing in Israel. Uh, cryptocurrency now, cannabis, um, uh, there's that AI, there's, always, there's, there's, there's so much happening. How, how is it like in such a small country? Uh, you have in Jerusalem. It's, it now there's a significant uh, tech hub, Be'er Sheva. Um, what what are you seeing? Sort of the growth of not just like these stars, but these incubators and R and D. Yeah, so it's true. I mean, every, every single city now is you know it was traditionally it was Tel Aviv and Herzliya, now Jerusalem. You know, obviously Intel and Mobileye is a Jerusalem company, and you look at the App Store. You know, Lightrix is at the top of the ranks. It's a Jerusalem company. And there's so many innovative companies in Jerusalem. Like you said, Be'er Sheva and WeWork is, you know, open, is open in Be'er Sheva. And there's, it's really across Israel. Um, 
you know, I think at the end of the day, it's it's a, it's part of the DNA and culture in Israel of, you know, you go into a cab and you talk to the cab driver and in two minutes you realize that this is a side gig, really, he has a startup. Yeah. Everybody has startups in Israel. It's very, very much part of the culture. It's true, by the way, not only culturally, but also nationally in terms of, you know, the government and the chief scientist is very much supportive financially, emotionally, whatever it is. Um, and so really it's across the entire country. And I don't know if it's despite the size of the country or perhaps... Be, as a result of the size that we're, we're so small, we have to try harder and push harder. But not only is it a tiny, insignificant speck on the map, but it's also in the most unstable region on planet Earth. So we kind of have every excuse to just sit back and relax, but we're changing the world. Love it. You meet with dozens of entrepreneurs each day. Uh, no, no, a number. A number. A lot. A lot. Um, is there a, like a startup that is, is there, had that moment where you're like, boom, that, that's, that's going to be a game changer? Oh boy, there are, there are hundreds, literally, I'm not joking. A lot of them I, I wasn't fortunate enough to work with, but I mean, companies that like, uh, you know, just to name one example, literally hundreds, but name one example, it just it just shows you how innovative Israeli thinking is, right? So you, you look at the modern day office and you say, okay, you know, our computers are now our smartphones. Our smartphones are supercomputers, right? All these devices have evolved, but the printer hasn't evolved. The printer, the, the commercial printer, I mean, not the commercial, sorry, the, the consumer printer, not the commercial printer, not the 3D printer, but the printer that me and you print on, mm. it's still is a big clunky machine. So most people would say, well, it needs to be that size because you need to put the paper inside. Comes along Tufi Elbaum, a Jerusalem-based entrepreneur, and says, wait a second, why do I need to put the paper in the printer? And he builds a mobile robotic printer that walks on the paper and prints. Like, who even thinks that way, right? So the point is, it's the innovative thinking in Israel is just, it's really, it's off the charts. And I think, um, if it, you know... Again, I could probably name 150 companies right now without thinking, without thinking for a second of companies that came to me and I said, wow, how did no one else think of that? Yeah. But uh, it really is remarkable to see that if you look at the tech space, no matter how you want to look at it, you want to look at how much money is poured into Israel, you want to look at how innovative the companies are, you want to look at how impactful the companies are, how, how many unicorns, billion dollar companies, no matter how you look at it, Israel is either number one or number two in the world, mm -hmm. which is, I just looked at per capita how much invested in Israel in 2017. Not only is Israel number one, but we're two and a half or three times the amount of money per capita invested than number two, in the second one on the list. Mm -hmm. And the number two and number three are a little different. There's a small little you know, difference, but number one and number two, us and the rest of the world is just a massive delta. Are you seeing VCs from, from the States connect? So I think if you look at every single top tier VC, as far as I know, yeah. if, whether it's Excel, Lightspeed, uh, Benchmark, Sequoia, you know, even Andreessen Horowitz, Andreessen Horowitz doesn't have an office because they have a one office rule just in Silicon Valley, but they have someone on the ground. And he told me in an interview that I did with Mark Andreessen, who, for those that don't know, invented the web browser, he's kind of like a big deal. Uh, he told me as soon as they have their second office, we'll be in Tel Aviv. So all the top tier VCs, without exception, are either have either an office, a full office, or at least, at the very least, a man on the ground. But they're all investing in Israeli companies. If you look at, you know, Sound Ventures, Ashton Kutcher, and Guy Ozeri, Madonna's personal manager, right? He's sitting in LA and he's investing in Move It, right? So it's, it's, we see, you know, a lot of American investors looking uh, at Israel. But on a more fundamental level, I think it's kind of like a, um, an unwritten rule that the top tech companies in Israel build the R&D, you know, the, the departments in Israel build the tech in Israel, but then when they want to scale globally and market and sell to the world, they, they look to America. Obviously, it's a much bigger market, and again, coming back to the, the culture, to do marketing, you need to let people into your lane. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's good for when, when you're like that and you're kind of running forward and not listening to anyone, it's great for building technology, it's great for, when it comes to marketing, you need to be able to build relationships, you need to slow it down and be a little more subtle, a word that doesn't exist in Hebrew, mm -hmm. ironically and uh, accurately, by the way, doesn't exist in Hebrew, but, um, you know, there's definitely, you know, without America, from every perspective, how you want to look at it, Israeli tech would have, would, would be missing a leg, let's just say. I don't want to say have no legs, but it would be missing a leg. So, you know, it, it's a very, very strong and close-knit relationship between Israel and America when it comes to building tech startups and innovation. Uh, so you have a wealth of information, and uh, where can people learn more about what you're doing and, and uh, your adventures? Snapchat. No, I'm just kidding. HillelFold.com. It's the easiest way to find me online. Great. Thank you so much, Hillel.